everybody. This is Business of Design. You're in the right place if you are looking for all those things they didn't teach you in design school. If you're like me and design is your business, you want to hear from other peers who have solved some of the problems that you face on a regular basis. And that's what we're going to do today. We are going to be talking with a Miami-based interior design professional, and it's a fun conversation. Basically, it boils down to this. It's not enough to be talented. So many of us lead with that when we meet clients. Yes, my firm makes rooms look beautiful. I'll bet your firm does too. Talent is really a given. So if it's not about talent, then what is it about? I would say it boils down to all the other stuff, which I refer to as the experience of working with you. The client who has a great experience is going to pass your name on to other clients who will anticipate a great experience. And getting to the point where you can deliver a great experience, of course, is painful. Lots of scrapes and bruises and learning along the way. This podcast and everything we do at Business of Design is designed to make it a shortcut for you to get to where you need to go. In the episode, I mentioned that I'm speaking with Miami interior designer Stephen Gurowitz. Stephen's company is known as Interiors by Stephen G. He launched his firm in the early 80s, and since then, he really services an elite clientele in South Florida, and he has, get this, 80 employees. That's right, 8-0. I doubt that there are a handful of firms that can claim that number of employees. So pretty exciting stuff. Most of us don't want to have 80 employees. So I'm careful during the conversation to focus on the things that we all need if we're small independent design firms. But for those of you looking to grow, there's lots of good information here as well. For instance, Stephen said he often goes to job sites where he's not the first designer who's been there. That happens to all of us. And I always ask the clients what happened with the other designer. Never, ever does it happen that the client says, oh, that person was a jerk or did something hateful to us. It's always, according to Stephen, it's always that the designer was unable to listen to and interpret the client's needs and wants and desires. And the fact of the matter is there is no training for us around that. So what do we do? Well, we can go work for a firm like Interiors by Stephen G and learn some of these things by meeting face-to-face clients without having our name on the door. Most of us are thinking, ah, that ship has sailed. I'm too far past that. I couldn't go work for anybody else. In that case, We have to be prepared to do some self-reflection following jobs and really face what we did well and what we didn't do well. I had a conversation this morning with a group that I'm coaching. It's one firm and there are five of them. And the conversation really for about an hour focused on the fact that the owner was standing in the way of everybody making the kind of progress they dream of making. Because like all of us, it's her name on the door and she wants control of the project. So how do you separate yourself from those tasks you need to manage completely by yourself and those tasks you must turn over to reliable employees or contract providers? It's not an easy thing to do, but we all go through it. I had a similar conversation with uh, a client in Texas who is terrified of raising her fees and she's just not making enough money. And I think most of this boils down to confidence. How do we get the confidence to do the things we know we need to do, the things that you learn at Business of Design or the things you hear on the podcast when you don't have it? Well, one of the suggestions Stephen is giving is something that I do all the time, and that's role-playing. If you have questions you hate answering from clients, guaranteed those questions will keep getting asked until you figure out how to A, answer them quickly with authority, or even better, B, answer them before they're asked. And one of the ways you can practice doing that is through role playing. So consider the questions that really make your stomach kind of go, ugh. It might be, what do you charge? Or how long will this take? Or why is this sofa so expensive? Or I found something similar on the internet 
that was a lot less money. All of those questions have answers that will stop the client in their tracks, but you need to be prepared to give them when they're thrown at you and it catches you off guard. Role-playing is a really effective way to do that. So get someone who works with you or a design peer you trust and ask those questions over and over and over again until you land on an answer that you can memorize and internalize and repeat without blinking. As I said, this is the technique I use to gain mastery over the things that terrify me. So I really, really recommend it. Confidence is such an important thing to talk about that in a couple of weeks, I have a treat for you. It's a woman who's a coach. She used to be a lawyer, but she now coaches people on confidence and gaining confidence. And I have really enjoyed my conversations with her. So in a couple of weeks, we'll do a whole podcast about confidence. And I, for one, am going to need to listen to that over and over again. I'm going to let you hear directly from Stephen G. In just one moment, I'm going to do some quick housekeeping. Uh, Myself, Cheryl's got the day off, which is wonderful to try to catch up with everything after High Point. So High Point was a great success. Look for that to happen uh, next year as well, if you're interested. In the meantime, we've got some wonderful free events coming up. We've got a meetup in Los Angeles on May 2nd, sponsored by Kravit. It's going to be at the Pacific Design Center. Come out, ask your questions, meet some cool peers. Uh, We'll uh, provide you with something to eat and drink and uh, we'll make a podcast out of it. So your questions answered on the spot. I'm really looking forward to hanging out with all of you. We have a big party coming up on June 14th in New York City, sponsored by Fuego, and in collaboration with the interior design community, Lori Lazure. Really excited about that. Again, free, lots of coaching, lots of sharing, and a wonderful way to get to know those mature peers you need to have in your life. And speaking of that, we've had a few calls from members in Texas, specifically Dallas and Houston, who say, hey, what about our meetup? So I'm putting it out to the universe and to all of you wonderful people that we would love to do a meetup in Dallas and in Houston. If you'd like to be on that list, let us know. If you know of a great showroom that might want to sponsor the meetup, let us know. Um, The purpose of these, uh, specifically the one in Dallas, the purpose is to find a community of peers for a designer who feels she doesn't have the right support group. So if you feel you could use some more support, then definitely come to our meetups, make some friends, and at the end of the night, we hope you will find yourself part of a community of peers who will share and grow together. And we're really excited about being even a small part of that. So thank you for that opportunity. I should mention as well, there are two, two spots left for Palm Springs. Lots of people uh, saying they're interested, but so far two spots left. We really want to fill it. It's going to be an amazing opportunity. Lots of deep diving into learnings and building an editorial calendar if you've never done one for your marketing program, Uh, some guest speakers, some amazing opportunities to go inside some cool houses and learn about art and architecture and design. So please come with us to Palm Springs. It is October 18th to 21st. We want you and we need you to be part of the group. Go to businessofdesign.com for details on all the events. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate business challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses plus Kimberly Selden as your mentor and guide. Unlike traditional coaching, which can take years to produce tangible results, BOD is a fast track to immediate results. For independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers, just like you. Monthly membership is only $67.50. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Great clients, and I'm blessed. 
Well, it sounds like, uh, yes, you're blessed, and it's great that you acknowledge that. But looking at your website, I would also venture to say you have worked really hard to get where you are and build the kind of reputation you have in the industry. So that's amazing. And you're going to share with all of us on the podcast a little bit about how we might emulate you, for one thing. But number two, you're going to share specifically to those designers who work for a big firm like yours and tell them how to stand out in the crowd. Is that right? I am here at your disposal. (laughs) Excellent. Well, okay. So first of all, everybody, this is Stephen G. And if you go to his website, Stephen G. Interiors, you will get lost amongst the hundreds of project photos you will find there. Every single one of them, amazing. And it's just, uh, it sort of left me feeling like, wow, I'm not doing enough. I just don't have enough projects to fill a website like that. So that's Pretty, pretty impressive. Did you know when you started out that you were going to have a huge firm with a lot of employees? Well, you never know what the future holds, but definitively it was my direction and my drive as I opened Interiors by Stephen G. 35 years ago from the den of my own. Did you hear that, everybody, from the den of your home? So often you meet designers who are apologetic about having a home office and not having a staff of 5, 10, 15, or 80 people like you do. And the fact of the matter is everybody starts somewhere, and not everybody wants to build an empire like you have, right? Would you say that it's probably not even ideal for everybody to aim for a huge number of employees? It's a rarity because most of the super talent, as I would call it in the design world, I don't really believe has the wherewithal or the ability or desire to manage a team of 80 people. And um, it wasn't 80 overnight. You know, we're about to celebrate our 35th year as Interiors by Stephen G. So it was something that definitely just grew due to the need and the demand. And and thank God I was able to grow with it and be able to manage with an amazing, amazing infrastructure and team of people. So you did you start out in Queens? Because I definitely am recognizing what I would not describe as a Miami accent. I was born and raised in Queens, in Forest Hills. Uh, I went to Forest Hills High School and came down to Florida um, many times to visit my grandparents on spring break and just fell in love. How do you not fall in love with the the weather and the water and the sand? And um, after I graduated um, high school, I came to South Florida um, and... um, went to work, went back to school for a very short period of time, and then went to work for a newly formed boutique interior design firm. And um, I started, uh, as you would call it, from the bottom of the barrel. Um, I unloaded trucks, I delivered furniture, I cleaned a little boutique furniture showroom, and watched, listened, and learned from three amazing professionals um, and took a love to the business. And I grew with them to a point where I became a, an equity partner in the company. Um, and that was the first 10 years of my career. And probably um, for people listening, many are thinking that they've never worked for another interior design firm, but it sounds like you took that as almost an apprenticeship and there was a lot you could learn from working for a successful firm. Oh, there, there's no question about it um, because I learned from three very different veterans of the design world that had been in the design world their entire lives and melded together as what I would say is a mini partnership. And together, um, we built a business that became a very successful business as well. And um, as time grew on, 
I watched, listened, and I learned. And at that time, I was probably responsible for about eight or ten million a year in design business myself. And I realized and felt there was a better mousetrap, as I called it. And I opted to venture out and open up my own firm. But it's important, everybody listening, to note that you did learn from some people who are already running a successful, profitable business. So if you're you're thinking, gosh, this is really hard, maybe you're just starting out and you're wondering how to fast track your career, it might be by taking a step backwards and going to work for a successful firm. Would you say that's a fair assessment, Stephen? Well, I could say not only is it a fair assessment, but it definitely is a continuation of your design education. The schooling systems today all over the country only really teach you a small percentage of what is really needed to become successful. Um, They don't teach you the hands-on, the one-on-one with a client, the one-on-one with an interview. They teach you the basics. And, you know, you're sort of touted by an instructor. And over the years, we have interviewed just countless designers that have graduated a well-known design school. And what we find is you almost have to start from scratch because it's when you're dealing with a client or a developer or anybody that's looking to hire a designer, it's a lot more than pencil to paper. Right. Right. The stakes get very real, don't they? Um, I, I'm so curious now that you've opened this door to schooling versus real life. If when you're working with some of the designers who come under your wing at Interiors by Stephen G., can you tell right away who's an owner and who's going to always be an employee? And I'm I'm not casting judgment on either of those positions because... I've had some amazing employees who never want to be owners, but can you spot those designers who you think might be able to step out on their own one day, and how do you spot them? Well, you know, that's a a great question, and it's a question that has so many zigs and zags. I find that even some of the greatest talent under my roof doesn't want the pressure, the grief, the aggravation of being an owner. They would rather work, do an amazing job, and make an amazing salary. At the end of the day, um, I find that young designers that are starting off meet and aren't really taught, I believe, what is really needed to be a success in the design world. When you deal with wealthy people, that or wealthy corporations or big developers, you are at their mercy. So when young designers come to talk to me from actual design colleges that come and interview me, I tell them if they're not passionate about becoming a designer, if it's not in their heart and their soul, and they're not willing to devote the all-in concept they should find another career fast. <laughs> yeah, I would say that that's really true. So so over the years, you've had so many people come to you and interview for a position. Let's say some of the people who are running their own firms right now are thinking, you know, even if I wanted to work part-time for someone else, this seems like a good idea. What's the first thing you're going to tell someone who's going to interview with a successful firm about getting the job? They have to be committed. You know, talent is a great thing, and it's everywhere. And there are a lot of talented people that aren't successful as designers. And when they come to me and they've been an owner of a business, my biggest concern and my number one question is, can you live with rules and regulations? When when you own your own business, if you want to walk out at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you walk out. You know, could they be structured? Could they work under a structured environment? Because I believe that after the talent comes the structure 
and the organization to not only finish the design work, but deliver and install the project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd be surprised at some of the answers that I've received over the years. Well, you mean to tell me if I finish my work and I have nothing to do, I have to stay here? I mean, that's a question that I've, I've, I've been asked, asked many times. That person could never be hired by me. Right. Never. Right. At the end of the day, I would rather hire a student right out of school, retrain them and train them for six months, and then let them loose to make sure that they could stand on their own two feet because you can't teach old dogs new tricks. Right. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I'm sure I'm an old dog, but I do try to be teachable. You know, I do try to be teachable, but it's, Me but it's, too. yeah, yeah. Me too. Well, I don't think you can be successful if you're not teachable. I mean, over the years, you're talking about how you've taken these designers under your wing and I'm sure you've mentored them, but I bet you've learned a lot from the young people who have started under your wing as well. Can you think of an example of something you've learned from a designer who was new to to your employee uh, in the last few years? Is there something that you could think of in that category? You know something? The answer is yes. There is always somebody that wants to grow and you watch their commitment in their work, in their work ethic. And, and then they come to you and they say, you know, boss, I would like an opportunity to do this project. Let me show you what I can do. So, um, you know, being an aggressive person to begin with, you know, I love when a person is aggressive. I love when a person wants to say to me, let me prove that I could make this project amazing. I would never say no, rather than the individual that might sit back and watch the clock. Um, we're not clock watchers because we will allow a designer to grow and spread their wings with all of the support of an 80-person team. Mm -hmm. So as an owner, you want people that are going to want to be aggressive. Um, you're going to want people that are going to want to prove to you that they're better than the next. I admire that. You know, our whole country and our whole economic structure in the world of business regarding what business it was built on and still is built on those who want to excel. It's a blessing to have people like that under your roof. So it's partly just an inherent fire in your belly. And then the other thing that I want to say to young people too, if you land one of these plum jobs, um, it's an incredible education and the experience of a lifetime getting mentored under a roof like this because, as you say, there's 80 other people in your company who have your back. So mistakes are going to be minimized. It's not going to put you out of business. You're going to learn things in an environment where you're safe. So it's, it's really an incredible opportunity to win one of these plum jobs. In the summer here, we have students that intern with us from all over the world. We bring in three to four students a year into our facility in the summer, and they come from as far as Italy. We've had students from Italy. We've had students from all over the United States. We only have room for four, but we take four students every summer, and we let them learn the real world of design, as we call it, not just the educational world. Because, again, 90% of the win in being hired is to know how to present and understand your client, which they could never teach you at a school, as you know. Right, absolutely. Okay, so, so we spent a little time talking about that employee who comes to work for Interiors by Stephen G., which is was really cool. But now the client side of the business, because you did not get where you are, 
uh, by just knowing how to manage hires. What's the secret of being able to have multiple clients? And in particular, how do you grow your business for luxury clients? Because that's something people want to talk about all the time these days. So a secret to managing a whole bunch of clients. And then, you know, what's the strategy for growing your luxury business? You know, the strategy or at the end of the rainbow, it's always about the happy client after the installation. But the key that I have found and what I have heard for so many years from people, because I always say to them, why aren't you using the designer that did your last home or office or whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear the negatives. You always hear what the problems were. And you know the biggest thing that I hear year after year is that no matter what we said to our designer, they didn't listen to our needs. So at an interview stage for me, before we even get into style and taste, I want to know two things. I want to know their lifestyle and their needs to live in the new environment. Because that's how I develop a floor plan. That's how I develop my presentation. It's not always about what the designer wants. You as a designer, you have to be able to be a chameleon. You have to be able, if somebody says to you, I'm a lover of black and white, and I want my entire home black and white. If, if somebody says to you, Steve, I'm a minimalist, and I'm all about my collection of artwork, You have to know how to design and listen to your client. And 85 to 90% of the design world doesn't. And that's what we have found. Do you think they don't listen... I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is no one, I don't think they're malicious and I don't think they're trying not to listen to their clients, but do you think it goes back to the fact that there's really no proper training for hitting the ground running with a real life, you know, breathing budget concerned client? You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like, you know, I don't think they even I, know I that they're missing it. the mark. I get it. You, you, you know, I think you've hit it right on the head and we, Again, when we interview a young, budding talent, and we know that they're coming from a great school, a great design background, they are not ever taught the real aspect of what I call down in the pits. You know, eyeball to eyeball with your client. Knowing how to judge your client's body movements, knowing how to judge the client as an individual, you know, you have to, as you know, you have to be a bit of a psychologist. You have to be a bit of a friend. You you know, you're going through what I call an engagement period. And if the engagement is great, the marriage is great. You know, the, the word, I always use the word transparency. You know, when somebody sits with me and I had clients today and I said, look, I might not agree with everything you want. Not only am I going to tell you that I don't agree, I'm going to show you why. And at the end of the day, if I tell you that this is not going to work and you still want it, you're my client. I'm going to deliver what you want. But I'm not a yes person. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, absolutely. Oh, my God, is that great. It's not who I am. It's never been who I am. And you know something? I find that people appreciate that transparency and honesty. Mm -hmm. And and I'm doing my job, and that's the key. Well, they're paying you for an opinion, aren't they? I mean, they hired you because they probably saw something on your website that they loved or one of your happy clients told them, this is the guy, you have to have him and his team. Um, And so you're really doing them a disservice if you don't speak up and stand firm on your choices. Listen, you know, it's, it really is for the young student. They have to really get to a company that lets them sit in on meetings, interviews, let them hear the, the bantering back and forth, let them hear the laughter, let them hear when it gets serious and people start to talk finances. That is what, 
none of these students are really taught in any of these schools. And God, I hope I'm not going to make enemies. But it's the truth. It, you know, they come out with blinders on. And they got to take the blinders off. And they have to open up their eyes and their ears to a whole different scenario. Now, um, what would you say are some of the... When you're, when you're training someone who's relatively new, or maybe it's somebody you've had as a designer for a long time, and they're finally getting FaceTime with one of your clients, what are the important things you ask them to look for in the conversation? You mentioned body language. What kind of body language situations do you find yourself in? Well, you know, today, the average client that walks into an interview interiors by Stephen Jake are very glib. This is not their first, second, or third home. They've been through this many times before. And if they sense weakness, they're out the door. If they sense a yes person, they're out the door. They want that banter. They want to hear after you get through their lifestyle. They want to hear your direction. And you have to be prepared not to fumfer not to hesitate you have to be prepared to go right into where you want to take their project and you know the interview makes or breaks the the hire you'll either get the job or you will not at that table they're not going to go home and think about it i feel that that way too like my best clients and the clients that turn out to be repeat over and over again clients make a decision at the consultation, and we decide to work together. Um, and invariably, if that isn't what happens, you know, sometimes there's an, an, a spouse involved and they want to have a conversation. If that's a legitimate thing that needs to happen and they need to discuss it with their spouse first, they still will hire us within a few days of that meeting. Uh, it's never that we have to wait two or three weeks or a month or anything like that. So, so then the confidence is really it's key, isn't it? It's critically important that you're confident and you can look that client in the eye and tell them why they should hire you. It's, it's 95% of the sale, always. And what we do with students when they come with us and they come into the company, we go through role play. I become the client and I'm coming in for the interview to meet Barbara or Michael. And we, we sort of, After that interview, we then critique and try to explain and educate all these people. It's a process, believe me. No designer comes into my business, to our showroom, and will be let loose to deal with people from day one. It will never happen. Right. Um, We have worked too hard, too many years to build a business I'm not about to let anybody walk in and, you know, destroy it. Right. To say it lightly. And you probably, I feel this way, and I can see from your website and from listening to you might feel this way too, that you're in the sweet spot. You're in that spot where you have a reputation, where you have a constant stream of repeat and referral customers who want to work with you. And there's no way you're going to be cavalier about who has contact with those people at this point. Oh, Kimberly, you're right on target. In the 35 years of Stephen G., we have clients back for the seventh, eighth, and ninth time doing a new residence. Wow. And a good 80 to 85% of our annual volume is referral business and repeat clients. And that's an amazing, amazing percentage. And what a compliment to you. You know, what a compliment to you. I mean, that's incredible. So now, Stephen, channel channel um, Stephen when he started out and speak to those designers who work by themselves. Maybe they have one assistant. Maybe they have nobody. And that's their dream. You know, not necessarily 80 employees, but getting repeat and referral customers. What would you tell them to do right now today to start making sure that that happens? Make make sure your clients are thrilled with everything you do. There's no better antidote. There's no better prescription than somebody that loves what you have delivered. 
Do not oversell, ever. Do not make them think that they're getting something that at the end of the day you know that they're not. And that's the best advice I could ever give any designer. Your honesty, your integrity, and your finished product will only bring you to a very happy place years to come. And it never happens overnight, never. Right. It's years and years of devotion and hard work. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot now. By the way, that was a great answer and really something for all of us to think about. But I'm going to put you on the spot. Have you ever been in a position where you disappointed a customer? You let them down. um, You didn't manage their expectations. What happened and what did you learn from that? Well, there's not a designer in the world that does the amount of business that we do that every once in a blue moon winds up with an unhappy client. There are, you know, and and it might not be the designer's fault, but I'll take it on the chin because the buck stops at my desk, as I say. And if somebody's unhappy, I will make an appointment, I will go to their home, and I will say to them, tell me what you're unhappy with. And you know what you get, Kimberly? You get a piece of furniture. You know, I love what you've done but I hate the couch. I approve the couch and I know that I'm stuck with it. And, but it just missed my, my expectation. I'm very different and at a very different point in my career. And I'm able to do what a lot of people can't do. So what I say is let's do the following. Come into the showroom, pick out a new sofa, You know what you paid for this. If you pay less for the new one, I'll give you back a refund. If you pay more, you know, if if it's cost more money, there's a difference. You'll pay that. And nine out of ten times, you will make that unhappy person happy. But there's always that little tiny percentage that, you know, I always say sometimes you don't read the client 100%. And sometimes there are unhappy people that will never be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's the real world. Mm -hmm. So don't let, you know, to the young designer, don't let one bad apple ruin your bunch. You're going to run over those bumps, those hurdles. It's part of growing. It's no different than an upscale luxury car dealer. And all of a sudden you get a lemon. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, it's no different than an amazing woman's boutique of clothing. And all of a sudden you get the dress delivered and there's a rug in the side or there's a pull in the fabric. Life's not perfect. The design world is not perfect. Tell me what business is perfect. Mm -hmm. I love what you said, though, too, and what I'm going to take away from that is have courage to ask why they're unhappy. Have have the courage, have the commitment, have the integrity to go to the client hat in hand and say, what, what could I have done better? And is there anything I can do to make this right? I think that's incredible lesson for everybody. Of course, you have to. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Kimberly, you know, I call it, Face the bull, grab the horns, and face the situation. Don't be afraid. The <laughs> bull's not going to kill you. I like the imagery. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to picture that next time. I'm going to be like, okay, Stephen says, face the bull, grab the horns. <laughs> and just know that no matter and what happened, yeah, and no matter what the situation is, other designers have been there too. And so just do the right thing and clean it up if you can. I think that's amazing because you probably have turned around uh, some relationships doing that. I have turned around 99% of the few unhappies. And everybody has them. You'll have them throughout your career. It's unfortunate. People that tell you that they can visualize it, you do a rendering. They see the rendering. They see the piece of furniture. But there are those until it gets delivered and in that room, they don't have a clue what they looked at. And that's unfortunate. 
Wow. Wow. Um, okay. So I love to end every podcast. I could talk to you forever. It's been, it's been really exciting to hear a little bit about uh, all the wonderful things you do. And we're going to put links to your website and everything uh, for people to follow you and say hi as well. But I'd like to end the show with something called design intervention. And it's just what it sounds like. What can you tell those designers listening that would help them today? Like, what advice could you give them that is immediately actionable? Okay, well, you know something? I'm going to give you the best answer I can, not only as a designer for over 40 years, but as an owner of a business. Regardless of your contract, it isn't worth the paper it's written on because we all know if somebody wants to sue you, the contract means nothing. Um, that's the first thing that, that I could say. And being a little bit of old school, I use a, a phrase when clients interview me, and that is profit's not a dirty word. Everybody is in business to make money. You were in business your whole life and maybe still are in business. And you're here because you've made a lot of money and you're looking to hire Stephen G. Right. So am I not allowed to earn a living? So profit's not a dirty word. Don't let somebody nickel and dime you. If they're not going to allow you to make a fair living, you tell them no thank you. Oh, man. Everybody, I hope you're just going to take that in and accept it for the wisdom that it is. It's so true. So often interior design professions are apologetic about making a living, and that is absolutely um, not helpful <laughs> in any way, right? It's okay to make a living. No, Kimberly, Kimberly, a designer has one real thing that they sell, their time. The talent is a gimme. So if their time is what they're really selling, they're allowed to eat as good a dinner as everybody else. That's the best way I could say it. Oh my gosh, I love it. Will you come back on the podcast and talk to us another time? I would love that. And Kimberly, thank you for the opportunity from the bottom of my heart. Ah, oh, thank you so much and continued success. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the Business of Design community. If you love what we do, please show your support by subscribing to the podcast and rating our efforts. Remember, you can be a part of the podcast by sharing your comments, ideas, and questions via the BOD hotline at 416-780-9187, extension 107, or by sending an MP3 file to info at businessofdesign.com. And when you're ready to transform your business and your life, sign up for a monthly or annual membership. Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today. Start today.